accountable for crimes against humanity under international law. Today, now more than ever, that promise looks like a pipe dream. Our guest today has helped prosecute dictators, judged war criminals, and fought for human rights globally. As the founder of the Dowdy Street Chambers, he leads one of the world's biggest uh, human rights chambers. And with this unparalleled experience, let us welcome Jeffrey Roberts into the stage. So welcome, Jeffrey. How are you today? Oh, well, I only realized I hadn't been to Amsterdam for, since before the pandemic and before Brexit. And the trip to Amsterdam takes another 90 minutes <laughs> because you have to have your passport stamped and you wait in long 90-minute queues just fuming about the stupidity of the British people in relation to Brexit. I speak as an Australian actor, but uh, that's how I feel. You definitely didn't vote for it then. <laughs> well, they, no one knew that this is the sort of thing, the everyday inconvenience that that absolutely stupid exercise of nationalism um, people became obsessed with the idea of sovereignty. They didn't know what it meant, but they loved the idea of getting back their sovereignty. And this is a problem that goes throughout the world. You know, make America great again, make Russia great again. Yeah. As Mr. Putin so he invades Ukraine. And it's, it's a problem we all have. Perhaps Europe less so much. Poland and Hungary are not Even looking good. Populism has been rising. And mm. with populism, I think it's important to reflect upon the lessons that we learned, let's say, almost 80 years ago, um, when the last great uh, autocratic populist state was really prosecuted at Nuremberg, which also mm. happened to be the day when you were born. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm a sort of a museum piece, really. <laughs> my, my life, the length of my life is an indication of how little we've recaptured the legacy of, Europe, of Nuremberg, let's, which was that impunity would end. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. Do you believe it's failed to capture that, that promise that it tried to deliver on that day in Nuremberg? No, it has tried. It has okay. tried to live up to it, and we've seen, I was president of the court in Sierra Leone, where we did deal with war criminals. Charles Taylor, who fomented the war, is still in jail mm -hmm. in Britain. Um, there are Karadic and Mladic in jail from the uh, ICTY court. The Rwandan uh, Hutu producers of that particular awful genocide are in prison. So it has up to a point. And the point, I think, came perhaps in 2012, when all those demonstrators were out on the streets of Damascus mm -hmm. with their banners, Assad yeah. to the Hague. Mm -hmm. But Assad didn't go to the Hague, and the demonstrators were shot and followed by 400,000 refugees over the next four years. Assad was never rounded up. Why? Yeah, why? Because of the Russian veto, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Achilles heel of the United Nations, the Russian veto, which uh, Russia had a port on the Mediterranean. They yeah. wanted to keep it, so they backed Assad. And the various attempts that Britain and other countries made to uh, refer the situation in Syria to the ICC prosecutor were vetoed. Uh, yep. One was vetoed, and you don't need actually formally to slap on a veto at the UN, you just indicate mm -hmm. really? you it. You do Russia the in the last few years has done 14 vetoes, but indicated, and China has indicated, um, United States 
indicates quite a <laughs> so nothing gets put on the agenda. And that's actually quite a big topic. Obviously, that's a lot to unpack, but let's start first from the most recent one, Russia. As most of us would know, uh, President Vladimir Putin was recently indicted uh, by the ICC. Um, however, even beyond the president, there have still been horrific reports emerging from the conflict zones. Mm. That said, who can be held responsible for those war crimes that are still being committed on Ukrainian territory? Well, there are, you've got to make a distinction, first between mm -hmm. the crime of aggression, yeah. which Putin has without any shadow of doubt committed, as has Russia. Right. Can, the, can the ICC charge somebody for crime of aggression? Only under certain circumstances, okay. and Russia is outside those mm -hmm. circumstances. It hasn't ratified the ICC treaty, and although the ICC could prosecute aggression against Britain or France, it could not prosecute the crime of aggression against Russia or America. Because they haven't, because ratified. They haven't ratified it. So there you have an almost classic case of the crime of aggression which is the worst crime of all, in a way, because obviously all the war crimes that are occurring stem from that act of aggression. And all it takes to be guilty of aggression is to invade a member state of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine has been a member state since the United States, uh, since the United Nations opened for business in 1946. And it was invaded in a way that breached Article 2.4 of the Charter, mm -hmm. which says that you mustn't violently use force against another country. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's done so <laughs> in a way which has been disastrous enough in terms of consequences yeah. to qualify as aggression. There was a lot of debate when Trump uh, ordered a few missiles to yeah. be sent to Syria a few years ago because his daughter was upset at the pictures of the gassing. And they didn't do much damage, and the general view was that they didn't amount to aggression, even though technically it was firing on another country. So let's go to that crime of aggression, though. As you said, in your opinion, it is the most heinous of these crimes, in a mm. way. Is there any way for Putin to be held accountable for the crime no. of aggression? No, no that not at all. I, there are various well-intentioned ideas put up by Gordon Brown and a lot of legal academics right. who think that we should have what they call an ad hoc mm -hmm. tribunal. What which, would that look like? Which is a <laughs> silly use of Latin because it means a Western, you get a lot of Western judges and Western prosecutors and they prosecute. But is that a trial? A trial in absentia, in mm -hmm. my view, is no trial at all. You have to have an adversary procedure and you don't, you're not going to get it because Putin is not going to allow anyone to speak for him. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. got a lot of his speeches. I'm sure that a, a reasonable job, I'd be happy to uh, accept a brief to defend him, <laughs> if only to give the best right. arguments, which I would be sure would be refuted by any court. <laughs> but I would nonetheless do it, but it's got to be an adversary procedure. Exactly. And you don't, you, you can't get it because Russia will and never. You've also mentioned this before, you've answered this question numerous times before, but uh, if you were retained as uh, Putin's lawyer, how would you defend him? I'd defend him on the basis that in 2003, Bush, Blair, and others did exactly the same thing, well, not exactly but they invaded Iraq. And so the aggression that they showed mm -hmm. in 2003 would be one of my defenses. Again, 
I mean, we love talking in Latin, international lawyers, so we, we call it the two, two quoque defense. Yes, I did it, but you did it too. And uh, or you did it first. So that is the defense that would be mounted for legal and political reasons. It was a defense that was ruled out mm -hmm. at Nuremberg. The judges said, quite rightly, two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah. Simple answer. But uh, then the uh, very good German lawyer actually defending um, the Dönitz, the German admiral, mm -hmm. uh, called evidence from Chester Nimitz. Chester Nimitz was the great commander of the American Pacific Fleet. Right. And Nimitz said, yes, we used the same tactics against submarines right. that you're charged uh, here as a war criminal. So they weren't charged and they acquitted the Nimitz on that ground. So right. there is a bit of life to it. But I think that to wrong to make a right is a complete answer. There's a technical answer too, that in, we have a rule, every criminal lawyer knows it, against mm -hmm. retrospectivity. Mm -hmm. And in 2003, the crime of aggression was in this strange state of suspended animation. It had been the German Nazis had been prosecuted for crimes against the peace, which was the crime of aggression. Was the crime of aggression. Okay. The General Assembly at the UN in 74 said, agreed, this is a crime, but we've got to define it. Mm -hmm. And it was given to the International Criminal Court to define. They didn't get round to passing it until 2000. And 18, it came into force. Exactly. So there, on this technical legal argument, the crime of aggression was not available to charge Bush and Blair in 2003. It became available for Putin. So it wouldn't be wrong for in, Putin to say the West did it too, because as you mentioned, the crime against aggression was not enacted until 2017 and 2018. Mm. Yeah? That's right. So he would have. He would have no defense of the kind that Bush and Blair right. can okay. have. If the crime of aggression had been enacted in, let's say, 1997 instead of 2017, mm. do you think we would say Tony Blair in the Bailey? Would he be in prison? I wish, but I fear that that would not be the case because yeah. mm -hmm. there, first of all, I know him and I know the people and I was involved in those debates and I know that Britain would not have gone in to Iraq Why? if there was a crime of aggression on the books at that time because it required an utter assurance mm -hmm. from the Attorney General that the, the generals in Britain were vulnerable to going to the International Criminal Court and they said we want an absolute assurance that we and our men are not going to be subject to international criminal law. Mm -hmm. And I think that assurance couldn't have been given right. if there was a crime of aggression. And in that, on that basis, I'm pretty sure that Britain would not have joined America in invading Iraq. But we come back to what, at the end yeah. of the day, is the fundamental defect in the whole structure of international law. Everyone talks about the rules of the international order since 1945. Yes, there have been rules, but they've been a fundamental defect in the structure of international law agreed in 1945, mm -hmm. because it was agreed between five countries who were set up as the protector, as the, the, the permanent members of the Security Council, with a veto over everything the Security Council does. And it's the Security Council that are the protectors 
of peace in the world. And the five members of the Security Council, Russia, China, America, France and Britain, all have a veto over anything the Security Council does. What Russia has done is a monstrous crime that attacks the fundamental basis of the UN mm -hmm. and in any other organization it would be expelled. Why can't Russia be expelled from the United Nations like any other country? It's a permanent member. It is required I agree, in, in the Charter mm -hmm. that a country can only be expelled on the recommendation of the Security Council. So right. we come back to the power that Russia and China and America are given the structural mistake that was made in leaving everything in the control of the Security Council which could be vetoed by mm -hmm. a party right. to the conflict. The various attempts, of course, to do the obvious thing and say you, you can't use the veto if you're involved in the decision. But that's not going to go anywhere. So, in the end, is there any way to hold Putin accountable for crimes against humanity committed in Ukraine? Yes, there are a separate... I'm, I'm yeah. using the crime of aggression first. We've got to understand that there are war crimes. So many of them, we can mm -hmm. see them just by turning on the television. The latest bombed building, mm -hmm. which yeah. has civilians known to be inside. It's a war crime to kill civilians. It's a war crime to kill children. And there are over a thousand children have been killed so far. Putin is a man who kills children and kidnaps them. But he can be brought in under a doctrine. Because, of course, uh, he knows what is going on. He watches television. He knows about Maripol, where yeah. 1,200 people were massacred by his air force, knowing that there were women uh, and old men and children there. Uh, he knows about Bucha, Bucha mm -hmm. because it's been exposed the mass graves but he is commander and he is mm -hmm. the supreme commander is guilty via something called command responsibility if and this was developed against the japanese generals who marched allied british australian american prisoners to death in the philippines yeah. that uh, they were not only the ultimate commanders, mm -hmm. but they knew what was happening mm -hmm. and they didn't investigate or punish mm -hmm. the war crime. That is a form of liability that right. can be used against Putin because he's also insouciant, <laughs> as the French would say, about the casualties, about the deaths, mm -hmm. about the, the mass murders. So, Yes, he can be brought in, and war crimes are punishable by the ICC. The prosecutor, who's an old colleague of mine, Karim Khan, has made a start by mm -hmm. indicting him. Although technically it's not an indictment, it's a, an arrest warrant. Mm -hmm. An arrest warrant. An arrest warrant has been issued. Of course, it won't be. Uh, he won't be arrested any time soon. Then uh, why, why, arrest, why send out the arrest warrant? Well, it worked with Milosevic. It worked with... It took 20 years to work on mm -hmm. Mladic and yeah. Karadic. It worked for a few years with Charles Taylor until his money <laughs> ran out in Nigeria. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he couldn't afford the bribes necessary to protect him. And... Um, so there, it's possible mm -hmm. that Putin will be, there'll be a coup in Russia. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, any of the dissidents will take it. The generals may well take over. 
and surrender him as happened with Milosevic in a way. Uh, he may, you know, he's only 69, I think, in mm -hmm. 20 or 30 Not years' time. He might <coughs> hobble into the Hague like an old Nazi. But we can't count on it at the moment, and people aren't thinking through the consequences mm -hmm. of the invasion, because the consequences are mm -hmm. that the peace agreement, which has kept the peace broadly since 1945, is unworkable. It has the mm -hmm. Achilles heel of right. Russia, China, America on this being able to stop anything that the Security yeah. Council does. Now, I think that could well splinter the United Nations. What's the, of course, there are great things being done by UNICEF and yeah. okay things being done by the World Health Organization. There are very valuable sections mm -hmm. of yeah. the UN, but its rationale to keep the peace is no longer possible because the fault line has been exposed. There's nothing it can do about uh, a superpower, and particularly, well, all the superpowers are armed with nuclear weapons, and yeah. Putin has dropped hints, uh, Medvedev has gone much further, and uh, so it is a kind of nuclear blackmail. The, the right. West, NATO, will not use force against Putin, will not even supply airplanes because it's afraid of a nuclear response. I don't think it's likely. People reply, well, it may not be likely, but if it's possible, uh, we shouldn't alienate. So that is, uh, will the United Nations devolve into something that many people have advocated over the years, H. H. G. Wells in particular, when it was set up, that it should be a consortium of democratic countries that have the power to expel from membership uh, a country, no matter how large, which is authoritarian and which doesn't abide by the fundamental rules. That's looking into the future, right. but it is a possible, a possibility. If and, would the would United you be in favor of that possibility of a democratic United Nations yeah. that excludes That excludes countries? authoritarian countries. And uh, see how we go. <laughs> it's, uh, it is something that uh, is all an experiment has to be thought through. Right? What Wells said is, mm -hmm. After the failure of the League of Nations, we need a association of parliamentary peoples, mm -hmm. as, right. as he called them. But uh, that may yet be to be worked out. There was some uh, development along those lines with so-called Magnitsky laws. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about that for mm -hmm. a second. Mm -hmm. So could you explain what the Magnitsky laws are? Yeah, Magnitsky was a lawyer who was beaten to death in a Russian prison back in 2009 because he had blown the whistle right. on a massive tax scam that some corrupt cops and um, tax officials had done uh, using his client's company. His client was a rather remarkable American called Bill Browder, who was oddly enough, the grandson of uh, the famous leader of the Communist Party in America during the 20s, Earl and Brown. Ended up as a and he ended up, yeah. he, he did uh, commercial, yes, he ended up as a hedge fund trader in Russia. And uh, he was furious, of course, that his lawyer had been, in effect, killed for defending his interests. And mm -hmm. so he did a, made some videos about the crime mm -hmm. and uh, 
persuaded John McCain and a lot of big, uh, leading Democrats that they should introduce a form of personalized sanctions. Right. This would be sanctioning individuals who had perpetrated human rights abuse. And it was quite interesting that the people, and so they passed the US Congress mm -hmm. in Obama's time, uh, what they called a Magnitsky Act, and it sanctioned, um, which using national law, not international law, this was the great advantage of Magnitsky law, it's a local law mm -hmm. that freezes bank accounts and refuses uh, entry to individuals on the list. And listed were quite a few judges and doctors. The judges had very cruelly denied bail to a very ill and innocent man. And the doctors had mistreated him. And so these are all people related to the Magnitsky case? Yeah. Who had been involved in the death right. of Magnitsky. So that's why it was called uh, a Magnitsky law. Mm -hmm. And then it only related to Russia. But then in 2016, mm -hmm. um, America passed a new global Magnitsky Act in which they added serious corruption and were able to uh, pinpoint uh, quite a few individuals all around the world who'd been engaged in human rights abuse or corruption. Britain, in 2020, yeah. passed its Magnitsky Law, and finally the European Union yeah. passed it in 2020, Mr. Mm -hmm. Barroso who had come into the position not knowing who Magnitsky was, is now um, well aware and threatens it and uses it. So right. you do have the makings yeah. of a parliamentary peoples mm -hmm. right. uh, in terms of their Magnitsky laws. Russia has also announced similar laws, right, or similar sanctions, yeah. including on yourself. Yes. What's it like to be on the other side of the black law? <gasps> well, it was amusing. They misspelled my name. <laughs> I had to write to the Russian embassy, <laughs> pointing this out. If you're going to sanction me, please spell my name properly. But um, no, this is a futile exercise. Everyone who had criticized Putin and said he was guilty as I had, uh, was put on this sanction mm -hmm. list. I've got no, I uh, have been to Russia, I haven't been to St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. so I miss out on that. Uh, until, on the opera. And the, on the opera, yes, until the coup comes. But uh, you know, the, the sanctions, until the point at which they get to poisoning umbrellas mm -hmm. and so forth, which they have before. Poison, it seems, is uh, a way that the FSB, which is the successor mm -hmm. to the KGB, uh, likes to go. But a bit back to the Magnitsky sanctions, which mm. you call as a plan B for human rights. We've actually mm. seen this in action more recently with the EU, US, and Australia all sanctioning Russia. Its government, its affiliated mm. oligarchs, However, the war still carries on, and despite the sanctions, Russia's economy is still doing well. Does this mean the Plan B of human rights has failed? Possibly the Plan B has not been as successful as its progenitors hoped, although there is still time. Right. There is difference of view as to how the sanctions have impacted Russia, and mm -hmm. I think the best view is we've got to wait and see. But it, it certainly hasn't deterred aggression, no, right? So it hasn't. <clears throat> it has not stopped Putin, or mm -hmm. it has not made Russia willing to sue for peace or withdraw. That's true. However, it has certainly caused some punishment in terms of financial right. uh, defect to, to oligarchs whose yachts have been seized and so forth. It does suggest 
that Putin is not as influenced by his business community mm -hmm. or his oligarch friends as uh, some have suggested that his military seem to either be in control or at least to be closer to him than uh, his oligarchs. Some of whom, of course, have criticized the sanctions. Mm -hmm. They were imposed very much. There was a great uh, opposition leader called Boris Nemtsov, who was assassinated a few years ago. But after the Skripal poisoning, which yeah. was for, for and the Litvinov uh, poisoning, who were dissidents who were living in England, who were poisoned by Russia. He, say, he said, and everyone in Britain remembers it, if you want to stop Putin poisoning yeah. your people, stop his oligarch friends from sending their children to eat. But is stopping, which a lot of them did. But is stopping sending your kids to Eton really uh, equivalent to the justice people would face under international criminal law? No. Uh, and of course, people in Britain were over-impressed. Mm -hmm. To them, the idea of not being able to send your children <laughs> to private schools would be appalling. But the oligarchs were able to send their children to schools in Abu Dhabi and uh, right. so forth, and uh, it wasn't so big a deal. And when you are concerned with nationalism, I mean, basically, Putin is gripped by this semi-religious idea of greater Russia, mm -hmm. which he expressed in an extraordinary essay mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. He took himself off to his data and right. spent a week studying history. A and then wrote his history, yeah, so. thesis, 7,000 word thesis that academics from all over the world have critiqued, given a B minus or something. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it is redolent of this make Russia great again that grips him. And so he's not, with that as his ideology, mm -hmm. shared by a lot of his people, uh, it's not the oligarchs, his friends concerned about their wealth, mm -hmm. are not are kept at a distance. And it is the generals the, who will deliver greater Russia it was given away by Yeltsin, mm -hmm. um, that, that are close to him. So in that case, is there a, a plan C for human rights? <laughs> if sanctions have turned out not to actually deter war or really uh, restrict aggression in any way? Yeah, I think it may be that it is plan C, a new United Nations with, uh, hopefully, the economic and military power right. to stand up to countries like China with its very clear threats to invade Taiwan yeah. mm -hmm. and to Russia. And is, this feasible? Uh, is this realistic in the system that we are in today? Well, if today's system yeah. can't stop mm -hmm. China and Russia from causing tens of thousands of deaths. I mean, this is what is happening in Ukraine, deaths of both Ukrainians and Russians, and uh, the numbers are rising. Mm -hmm. And of course, Taiwan, the invasion of Taiwan would be hundreds of thousands of deaths. Then maybe, the answer is a union. I said to you that the United Nations should shrivel, if you like, but maybe expand, who knows, mm -hmm. into an agglomeration of democratic or quasi 
democratic countries with the trading power and the military power to deter. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot more countries than just Europe and Australia and America on the scene, or China and Russia. What about a country like Brazil, um, or somewhere that's mostly democratic, or is fully democratic, but maybe has interests in both parties? Yes. I think the, uh, we may see more from India, South yeah. Africa, mm -hmm. Brazil, um, the neutral countries mm -hmm. hold interesting positions. It may be if they join such an organization as I'm yeah. uh, proposing, mm -hmm. or at least thinking about, um, that that would give it more legitimacy, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. And they are democracies with all the, <laughs> as Winston Churchill said, the worst form of government apart from all the others. <laughs> and uh, so just as Brazil can elect Bolsonaro, mm -hmm. so America can elect Trump and may mm -hmm. even do so again. Maybe. Um, so on that note, I think we're going to open up to some audience questions. Um, if any of you have a question that you would like to ask, please raise your hands and we will bring the microphone right around to you. You there in the hat and the glasses. Hi, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation, conversation. Um, I would like to go back to the very basics. You were talking about um, crimes against humanity. You were talking about human rights, and I'd be interested, how do you conceive it? Do you think we construct human rights, we construct what war crimes are, or is that something that just naturally follows from who we are as people? Thank you. It's an interesting question, because uh, we haven't just invented human rights. We, just, we haven't just invented war crimes. They've been around for centuries. And if you go back to the, gosh, the uh, 1640s, the civil war in Britain, uh, each of the armies, the kings, parliaments, and the Scottish army, they all had their war crimes uh, documents and their codes and uh, I suppose the first war crime was, goes back to about the 13th century it was the Lateran Council edict that crossbows were banned in wars between criminal between Christians not in wars against the, the against the Turks or the Arabs you could use a crossbow but this was the first war crime to use, a, use crossbows in wars against Christians. And then over the years, the idea that you shouldn't kill your prisoner, mm -hmm. and that became a serious war crime. Cromwell, on his way to in Ireland, would punish, execute soldiers who raped or, or stole from the local population, and so on. So that the war crimes were the kind of war crimes that are being committed in Ucha and Maripol today were war crimes 500 years ago. The killing of prisoners, the killing of civilians, uh, Charles I was convicted and hanged by the Republicans on an indictment which included his order in the killing of prison. So this is no newfangled idea of human, the human rights campaigners. It's always been there and uh, it was, I suppose, the Nuremberg judgment that crystallized the crimes that had been committed by the Nazi leadership. Mm -hmm. So I think we're looking at maybe a human desire that has become more 
pronounced because it's become more possible the idea of justice, of punishing these particular crimes that have been denounced over the century, centuries for their lack of ethics. Right, another question from the audience perhaps. Uh, let's go in the back, I see a distant hand. You mentioned a potential coup against Putin a couple of times during the interview. I was wondering, do you believe that it is inevitable or do you believe that it's going to happen because it certainly did seem that way and I'd be interested in the reasoning behind that. Well, I would wish it was, but it's not. And uh, he may live out his life. I think the Russian people, and it, their guilt is interesting and worth examining rather as German work war guilt was examined uh, by the philosophers after the Second World War. But Putin's overthrow is by no means predictable. He could go in the way that Milosevic went, surrendered by the Serbs in order to aim to be a, get into Europe and to uh, have sanctions lifted. He could go the way Charles Taylor went and just overcome by rival armed factions. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, Karadzic and Miladic were pretty much abandoned by their own people and protected by the Orthodox Church which has played a very uh, deeply worrying role, not just in the Balkans, mm -hmm. but in Russia, where the patriarch is virtually, his might is a war criminal mm -hmm. by the way he endorses and whips up support among the people. Then do you think those who also endorse the current war and those who are actively politically engaging in it, spreading more propaganda from the Russian side, should they be held responsible for war crimes as well? Yeah, I think that was the view of a number of philosophers who right. considered mm -hmm. German war guilt, those who were actually involved in the unlawful killings that the Nazis undertook should be, considered, should be tried but the German people as a whole who elected Hitler yeah. in yeah. the first place and stood by him until the end should certainly were culpable. They were politically responsible mm -hmm. at any event. But can they be legally responsible? No, if they knew, they all knew about the camps, that was obvious, by mm -hmm. 1945. The Russian people all know yeah. about the war crimes. They could see it on their television, no matter how much propagandists dress it up. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, they are. 80% of Russians supported Putin in a poll taken a month after he'd gone to war. I think that it has reduced, obviously, while the war drags on, and conscription applies, and in, in the cafes, in the internet cafes of Georgia and Armenia, mm -hmm. you'll find uh, 100,000 young Russians who right. refuse to fight Putin's illegal war. I mean, they're the future of Russia if they get the chance to go back without being called traitors and rats and so mm -hmm. on, which is Putin's vocabulary about them. Um, thank you. And we'll take one last question from the audience. There was one at the back. Okay, um, you had mentioned the potential of reforming the UN um, through shrinking it or expanding it. In our generation, we're very aware of the 
urgency of decolonization, and I'm wondering if you see any real potential for the UN to be decolonized in the sense of giving equal voting power to all member states? Uh, well, it's interesting, isn't it? The General Assembly gives the same voting power, i.e. one vote, to a country like Antigua, which has 60,000 people, mm -hmm. to, as to a country like India, which has how many millions? Of almost a billion, billion. I think. Yeah. <laughs> 1.4 billion. Almost 1.5 billion. Yes, 1.5 billion. So you wouldn't call that equal voting power. No one has yet suggested, or I'm sure it's around in the reform UN literature, that uh, India should have 150 times the voting power of Antigua. But that is the nationality or the state sovereignty bias of the General Assembly. Uh, there is no equality of voting. When it comes to the Security Council, you have these ten positions that alternate every two years and uh, are decided by blocks of vote. There's the European bloc, which includes Australia and New Zealand. There's the this block and that block. And so you get a changing, shifting cast, but the top, the big five, are in control, because they can veto. And I see the future in the short term. There's a sense that the General Assembly yeah. has to step up, because right. the Security Council is pointless, utterly collapsed, and so is that the sense that the uh, General Assembly will step up? Yes, I think there are signs. Okay. The General Assembly uh, condemned the invasion right. by about 140 votes to... Mm -hmm. uh, there were seven in favour of the... Seven voted no, 34 countries abstained. Mm -hmm. And it is the worry over the abstainers. It's extraordinary that mm -hmm. countries like South Africa, yeah. and India and Pakistan will not <coughs> take a view on the killing of children. Thousand of them. That is a red line. You would think mm -hmm. that countries, former countries of the Commonwealth would be would would vote against, but they don't, because they owe something for yeah. Russia, uh, or they have trade agreements which are still valid. So mm -hmm. that's, but you saw the General Assembly, I don't know whether you noticed two weeks ago, the General Assembly voted to refer climate change the Vanuatu case. to the Vanuatu mm -hmm. case refer climate change to the International Court of Justice. And this was actually quite a revolutionary yeah. decision. Mm -hmm. And it will give the International Court of Justice the opportunity to develop rules about climate but change. The, the decision of the International Court of Justice it will not be a binding decision, right? It will be advisory. No, but it will be like all ICJ decisions mm -hmm. yeah. have a certain force. Right. Soft power, if you like. <laughs> but uh, there are countries, and Britain mm -hmm. and France are among them, who generally, because the ICJ declares international mm -hmm. law, generally abide by it. Right. I mean, I'm trying to get Greece to follow Vanuatu and get yeah. the Parthenon marbles referred to the International Court of Justice <coughs> on the question of the duty of states mm -hmm. that had looted and committed war crimes in the past to get the property, the cultural property that now 
is exhibited in their museums to actually send it back to those countries, including the Parthenon marbles. Just, just to but test the effectivity of the ICJ then, mm -hmm. let's say that they did make a decision in favour of Greece and that the Parthenon marbles should be returned. That's still an advisory decision. Do you yeah. think the UK would actually then return the marbles? Yeah, it generally does. There was a famous statement about the, I think the ship was named, they were all named after ships, <laughs> a ship that had gone to arbitration. It was a, an American ship that had been seized in a war with Britain in the 19th century. And uh, it was an outrageous decision. Britain was really um, justice miscarried. There were five international judges who ruled against Britain. And uh, Gladstone was the British Prime Minister. And uh, he said, he made a, an official policy announcement saying this is a mm -hmm. gross miscarriage of justice, but the justice of the court is nonetheless better than the justice of the sword, and we will follow even decisions by international courts that are wrong, right. we regard as wrong, because of the greater objective of mm -hmm an international law that avoids war. So I think Britain has, and that's why, mm -hmm. Britain would not have gone into Iraq mm -hmm. uh, if there had been a crime of aggression Do, do you think the states would have gone into Iraq? Yes. They would have. Oh, absolutely. Regardless. Yeah. So we still have an Iraq war, but we yeah. would at yes. least have the moral position of Britain. Right. Okay, um, well, firstly, thank you all for the brilliant questions, but now we're actually like to open another small section that you have focused your work on, which has concerned obscenity, libel, journalists, and truth tellers. So connecting to crimes against humanity, why do you find freedom of speech especially important for crimes against humanity? Well, you can see that there is no freedom of speech in Russia. Mm -hmm. The minute the war was declared, you had the Lickspittal Duma, the Russian parliament, pass a law 15 years in prison mm -hmm. uh, for denying uh, that it was, <laughs> for saying that it was a war and not a special military operation. And so uh, we've had a friend of mine who was uh, sentenced to 25 years imprisonment mm -hmm. yesterday, a uh, dissident called yes. Kara Mertzov, who has uh, been a very formidable mm -hmm. voice against exactly. Putin, made the mistake of going back to see his family in Russia, right. was arrested, and is Sentence now... Sentenced yesterday, I believe. Yeah, yesterday. Mm -hmm. 25, 25 years, years yeah. for saying that Putin is wrong. So. Free speech, I think, is very important. And the occasion uh, I spent part of my life as a free speech lawyer, and mm -hmm. the British laws of defamation and privacy yep. are far harsher than anywhere else in the world. The Americans call London the town named Sue because everyone comes to try to vindicate or refurbish their reputations and a lot of oligarchs and Putin's friends have been uh, hiring British law firms to sue uh, for defamation or breach of privacy and I thought this should stop so I wrote a book about why it should stop. Mm -hmm. um, but Any the, improvement since then? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, they, some of the law firms that charge make or have made exorbitant profits over um, acting for the oligarchs have uh, stopped acting for them and it's not mm -hmm. as liable, is not as uh, serious a threat to free speech as it was. But I think right. it took the Ukraine yeah. invasion to make the British people aware 
of how their laws have been used and to intimidate. How else can we safeguard then freedom of speech? Sorry? How else can we safeguard, protect freedom of speech now? Well, it becomes difficult because there is so much trash on social media and people oh. say we should have the same regimes mm -hmm. for press, television and social media. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an argument and it's, you have to, I think, put up with a lot of uh, bad speech, if you like, mm -hmm. on social media before you can, but it's a question of where the hammer comes down, where you hate speech. Line? You draw a line about, uh, the easy line to draw is incitement to violence, mm -hmm. okay. but people want to draw a closer, a, line. A closer line about uh, treatment of trans people, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's where you have to consider the nature of social media. Right. It's privately open. Mm -hmm. There is a point at which private companies can say, no, we don't want to indulge Donald Trump yeah. or yeah. whatever. And do you think private companies should have that right? Because they are a well, platform for speech. Of course. But they, one can always go to another private company. Yeah. And Donald Trump can always sue for breach of contract. If mm -hmm. his, but at the end of the day, there is a right of the private mm -hmm. company to say, well, I don't want to host this right. mm -hmm. hate preacher. And uh, why should they be forced to do that? And this is where pressure of mm -hmm. their advertisers, pressure on their advertisers comes in. Right. Mm -hmm. But we would rather, I mean, we live in Britain with the BBC, which yes. is a government yep. organization. And, and it strictly enforces neutrality of its Yes, and so we would not. I don't think that for any attempt to withdraw mm -hmm. an issue from even a government sponsored right. program, a uh, television channel, is problematic. And um, there's also one question actually that we wanted to ask you back. It's how far should an open and democratic society tolerate intolerance? <laughs> As far as possible. As far as possible. So up to the line of <laughs> Now that's a question begging answer, but up to the point of violence, up to the point at which it's demonstrable that whatever it's promoting. I mean, in Australia last, yeah. not long ago, uh, there was a murder mm -hmm. by a three sort of oddball mm -hmm evangelical, inspired by America. They just murdered the police, three or four police who came to check on them. And crimes like that, which are inspired, there was a much worse one in New Zealand, yeah, mm -hmm. where uh, 50 people were killed. Uh, the way in which some website engage, encourage, and incite mm -hmm. right. killings uh, needs to be more carefully studied. But where there is evidence, then John Stuart Mill's proposition right. mm -hmm. becomes live, that the only basis for suppressing speech is harm to others. Mm -hmm. And so if you can show harm to others, that's your ticket to suppress. So does that mean that it should cause directly harm to others or that it has the potential for causing harm to others? Because today online, it is mm. so grave sometimes what a text could actually be referring mm. to. Well, that's the task. Okay. Mm -hmm. Usually that's what happens is um, a murder, murder, mass murder, and then we find out later the instigation 
right. of the thought. But of course, what happens in America every week uh, can be largely put down to gun crime and to the laxness mm -hmm. of American law. But also, on uh, a similar note, you have defended Julian Assange for yeah. the founder of Weeklies. And something more recent with free speech leaking of, let's say, the Pentagon uh, US intelligence files, would you then also defend uh, Jack Stixero? Oh, <laughs> I defend anyone. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, uh, whether I would support them, I don't know. I, Assange was different. Mm -hmm. None of the stuff he leaked was top secret. Yes. And the classification top secret is the classification that has to be used mm -hmm. if lives would be at stake yep. from the release of the information. So uh, this latest mm -hmm. one was a lot of top secret yes. stuff. So no one was harmed by Assange's leak. And the second thing is that the, he was motivated by a desire to expose American war crimes. Mm -hmm. And the killings, I don't know whether you remember seeing the videotape of the helicopter, Apache helicopter attack on civilians, journalists, uh, Reuters, Reuters journalists, I think. Um, that was released, as were a lot of other mm -hmm. information to show the way America was conducting the war right. and American war crime. This doesn't seem to be the motivation, be the motivation yeah, at all of the other. But it's, if you like, extraordinary that after the Assange case, yeah. which was a leak mm -hmm. by 22-year-old Chelsea Manning, Mm -hmm. uh, this guy is 21 year old mm -hmm. and, and the stuff was was actually released or distributed mm -hmm. to 3 million American servicemen of different ranks so after and, and the Assange mm -hmm. material mm -hmm. went out to 2 million mm -hmm. so right. it does make you wonder about the security efforts of the Pentagon. <laughs> but th there is a great case in America mm -hmm. called the Pentagon Papers case. Yeah. And uh, it said that you know, an informed public is the best safeguard for uh, a democratic society. And, uh, but it did say there were exceptions and troop movements in wartime. Mm -hmm. is one of, those well, it's one of those exceptions. So I think some of this material comes under that. Right. Yeah. Can you make a prediction about where you expect this to go? I think it's going to be a long time. I think they're going right. to delay. Mm -hmm. And uh, because at the end of the day, it's unclear just what the, uh, how wide the distribution was. Yeah just what the guy is going to say in his own defense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're about to wrap up this interview. We do have one final question. So today you've joined us again at a university campus. You yourself were a rabble-rousing student hmm. uh, for almost 50 years, or a little over 50 years ago. Um, we've talked about your vision for an alternative UN, uh, the importance of freedom of speech. I suppose we're wondering, how do you think students today should try to fight for justice? Well, they should try everywhere, but what has happened, I suppose, uh, I grew up in the Vietnam mm -hmm. era where we had something, we had a war to demonstrate against, yeah. and a lot of us went to prison, for, were beaten by police, and so forth, but that was in the cause of trying to stop the mm -hmm. American war. Yeah. In Vietnam. Now, today, there hasn't been much of a cause, and a lot of student protest has focused on local issues, mm -hmm. right. like the treatment of minority groups mm -hmm. in the capital city or whatever. 
So that's certainly still valid. Yeah. But one wonders whether with with a war back again mm -hmm. on the agenda, whether students will be motivated to protest more violently or vigorously against the war in Ukraine. It seems to me that this is a war where Russia is killing children, is killing civilians. There is nothing to be said, actually, for Russia committing mass killings in Ukraine, and whether students will be a bit more vigorous than their politicians in burning down the, American, the, the Russian embassy, for example, or in stopping sports teams playing with Russia. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was at university, we were out on the pitches. It was uh, to stop Russian, uh, to stop South, South Africa yeah. Yeah. cricket games, and of course, and football. Because of the apartheid. South Africans mm -hmm. worship their sports men, as though they were all white, they wouldn't allow any black sportsmen, no matter how good, to right. play. And so when Australia, where I was started to run onto pitches and disrupt mm -hmm. play, of course the police would pull you off, but you'd make a point, you'd stop mm -hmm. the game. Well, why should we play sport with Russia? There's a current debate about that mm -hmm. at the moment. What is your sporting body mm -hmm. saying? Are they pretending that Sport is this wonderful thing that endows us all with love and harmony. Or are they taking the view that representatives of a nation who are, who bear a degree of war guilt as the Germans did, should have a team that plays in Amsterdam? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would... Or the Olympics, which is yeah, the, the Olympics. So. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's another opportunity for 60s kind of protests mm -hmm. that those at university to take. with a moral superiority, mm -hmm. you, could, you could say, to their elders. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the thing, I think, that emerged from the 60s. That right. Our elders were really not as good as they were cracked up be. They didn't know what they claimed to know, and they were morally wrong in killing innocent people in Vietnam. So one would hope that the kind of energy, which, uh, yes, is expressed by young people in relation to green issues. Yes, mm -hmm. climate change in particular. Yes, that, uh, whipped up by Greta Thunberg, that there should also, and perhaps more urgently, be so for a protest, a strong and vigorous and even violent right. protest against Russia, thank Belarus and Hungary. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Jeffrey Robertson, for talking with us today. And thank you all for joining this interview. Um, next week, we'll have an interview with the CEO of Tata Steel Netherlands at Room for Discussion on Monday from 1 to 2 p.m. And as always, you can find all of our upcoming and previous interviews on YouTube and as a podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. Jeffrey Robinson has also written many wonderful <laughs> books, um, including Rather His Own Man, which is his own autobiography, uh, and also... Um, Crimes Against, Crimes against humanity. humanity, his legacy textbook there, and Bad People, uh, a more recent book about Magnitsky sanctions. And Lawfare as well, definitely a little read you should all check out. There's still so, many more. But... Thank you so much for joining us today um, with Room for Discussion. And thank you as well to our audience for coming in. <laughs>